Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our inaugural episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. I'm here with Robert Rose. Robert, you've got so many descriptors next to your name. Author, thought leader, <laughs> maker of maps for change, cool dude. And typically you're taking over big stages and flying around, but I've got you here in your virtual office today. How are you? I'm doing well, my friend. It's always good to see your face, hear your voice, and I'm glad to be here. I think cool dude will be the descriptor I, I, I actually take with me. So um, that's the one I'm most proud of, I suppose. That's cool. <laughs> so this is marketing cheat codes. We're going to be exposing, for folks that don't know what a cheat code is, it's that, that opportunity to get a strategic advantage, like in video games. Right uh, back in the day, it was uh, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start to get to the next levels of the game. We want to talk about getting to the next level in marketing. So, Robert, I know you've got a cheat code. I really want you to share that. Uh, but how about video games? Have they ever played a part in your life? Oh, my goodness gracious. We could make the whole show about this. Um Yes, uh, I am. So not much these days, I would say, just because life and business has gotten in the way a bit of me spending any time. But as a kid, and certainly through college and early adulthood, gaming was a huge part of my life. So I'm old, you can tell by the gray hair. Um, so I grew up with, you know, not only the the great arcade games like Defender and Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and, and Galaga, which those are my favorites right off the top, but also the home versions of, you know, Atari and television, Coleco, mm -hmm. um, all of those things as well. And then as I got older, I got into computer games for the most part, you know, sort of PC based games. Um, and, uh, and, you know, was first person shooter like doom and, and, um, uh, and all of those as well. So yes, is the, is the short answer. It kind of depends on how we want to segment it really to get into the specifics. That's great. I remember, uh, with, uh, CMI, you guys had a great theme one year of game on. I love that. Uh, that was a great theme that pulled through. And so let's, for the audience to get to know you, Take me back to the beginning a little bit, like your origin story. How did you get to be where you are today in your career? Like literally leading a movement of content marketing and uh, content operations that we'll get into. Sure. Well, I started in the entertainment business. Um, funny enough, I moved out here to Los Angeles and I was going to be a rock star and a writer and yeah. all of that. And that turned out about as well as you think it might. Um, and uh, I got into marketing and TV um, because quite frankly, I just needed something to pay the rent and fell in love, quite frankly. Um, you know, it was just, a, it, I, I sort of immersed myself in the practice of marketing and, and everything around it. And Kind, kind of cut my teeth there and then ultimately grew up sort of through the late 90s and early dot-com boom and bust periods, um, sort of really getting into digital um, and, you know, building big websites and email programs for a lot of the biggest companies here in town. And then I ended up um, at a startup company in the early 2000s, Enterprise Software, um, typical, you know, two rounds of Silicon Valley funding and the whole thing. And, and I served as the CMO there for eight years. And it was there that I sort of discovered that there was this new way of going about marketing because my theory, um, which I didn't know there wasn't even a term for it, was that if we were ever going to compete with the likes of IBM and Hewlett Packard and Microsoft, and these are the companies that we were competing with at the time, that I would have to be something different, right? We were never going to compete with them on brand or SEO or even spend or anything like that. So the theory was basically, if I could be a mile deeper than any of them are, you know, in terms of the thought leadership and what we're providing there, then at least when we get invited to the table, we're on equal footing. And that was sort of a big thing. And so much to the chagrin of my board and the senior management team, I didn't build a classic marketing organization. I built a team of designers and journalists and writers and creators who basically we built a little media company inside the software company and published everything, blogs and webinars and white papers and events and all of these things. And it worked, weirdly enough. 
Um, and then I met this guy, Joe Polizzi, uh, who was really talking about the same thing that I was, only he doing it from the media business. And he had coined this term content wow. marketing, um, you know, in his book, Get Content, Get Customers. I tracked him down and um, we had dinner and became just almost fast friends immediately after, you know, after that. And he was starting this thing called the Content Marketing Institute and said, you know, hey, if you want to go all in on this content thing, let's do that. And I was like, yes, the timing is perfect. I joined up with him in the early stages of that company. And then we built that company over the course of the next six and a half years to uh, through its acquisition and really building Content Marketing Institute as a evangelist of the practice of content marketing and content strategy and and all of that. And since the acquisition and Joe riding off into the early sunset, you know, of his orange colored money, um, basically, I'm still working for a living and spend most of my time these days doing consulting and advisory and coaching and training for bigger companies, usually bigger brands that are trying to figure out how to operationalize this whole yeah. content. So change. you're still you're still transforming and reinventing is is what I've seen. I have observed. And yeah, you're helping these um these organizations get to average to genius brand level. And um, have you seen, and so it started with content, but isn't content really taking over more of the strategic center, if you will, of these organizations? Because content's like the medium anymore. Every dimension of commerce is content now. So it's, it's like moving more into the middle and it's even the operational underpinnings have become so strategically important that you've helped organizations move through. So what are your thoughts on that concept of content operations taking a, um, having a, a real narrative right now strategically? It's, it, it's probably the biggest trend that we see, you know, it's, I mean, and it's, it's supported by research that we do each and every year, but beyond that sort of the aggregate sort of looking at the broader research, I can just tell you anecdotally from the, from the you know twenty or thirty engagements we do with big brands every year, this is front and center. Which is, you know, even post pandemic, let's call it the you know the the rise of importance of content marketing and content strategy. Because, but somebody asked me the other day, they they said, you know, do you think content marketing has become more important over the last? year and a half. And I said, no, I don't think it's become more important. It's always been super important. It's just now finally a recognized priority for most businesses. And I think what's happening, what we see happening anyway, this observation we have is that at some point, businesses, CMOs went, oh, yeah, we got to get good at content, right? We got to get good at digital. We got to get good at customer experience. We got to get good at creating all of these platforms, whether it's blogs and resource centers and websites and email programs and social media got to get good at content because that's what fuels all of that. And so let's hire journalists, let's hire editors, let's hire writers, let's hire creators, let's hire designers, and we'll build our little in-house content factory. And then somebody went, but wait a minute, we did that and we're still not scaling any better. We're still not operating any more efficiently. We're still wasting tons of money. We're creating, you know, X amount of content and half of it's not used or seen or organized or structured in any kind of way. And so we've seen this trend of the two worlds coming together, that which we would sort of holistically and historically call content strategy, structure, digital asset management. How do we get, you know, content from ideation through to activation, measurement of operations of getting content out there. And, you know, I, I maybe have too cutely said that I think content operations is the new marketing operations. It's like marketing operations mm -hmm. finally found a renaissance in something. And it was like, how do we get our arms around all of this content function? And those two teams we see joining forces these days in ever more, um, in ever stronger ways by big brands that are saying, we not only need to solve the quality and the quantity of what we're producing in a valuable way, but we also need to do it in a way that we can track, measure, scale, and ultimately structure so that the business communicates in a coordinated way. At the end of the day, content strategy is nothing other than coordinated communication. Yeah. That's super powerful. And there's this idea that you talked about in there that you create all the content, there's a there's the risk for it to be wasted, then the effort it took to create the content 
there's like content ROI, but what I'm also hearing is a re content return on effort, getting that content created out to market, working for you, not just getting the outcomes the, of traditional content marketing, but then also now that you brought the operational side and equation into it, it's how much did it take, how cost, time, resource, overhead to create that amazing content experience. You now have more of like, it sounds like there's more of a full equation built out on the, the power that content can deliver. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's funny. It's, you know, we spent the early part of the 2000s standing on stage, standing in front of clients, standing in front of anybody who would listen. And for those of us like you and me who have been in this business for a long time, sort of saying, we need to be more like media companies. We need to act more like publishing companies. We need to act more like a media company in the way that we use content. And that got misinterpreted in many ways to say, oh, you mean we should market ourselves like a media company or we should sell our content like a media company does? And no, that's not it. It's we need to treat content in the same care and feeding and fashion that media companies do. Media companies understand how to reuse, repackage, reskin, re, you know, really make advantage of the asset of the ideas that we're creating and separate the idea of the stories we're telling, the content we're creating from the expression of it, right? So media companies understand that it's not just the movie, it's the merchandise behind the movie, it's the novels, it's the comic books, it's the television show, it's the radio program, it's the podcast, it's the emails, it's, it's, you know, it's all of those things working from one big valuable asset called our story. And that's what we mean here. And it's that function of, 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 it's just a changing muscle and an idea in many of these product and services companies who say, oh, right, we need to get our arms around this. We need to, you know, it's, we have no shortage. I, I have so many CMOs and CFOs and CEOs say, we've got no shortage of good ideas. We just don't manage them very well. And that's the real challenge is, We've got tons of great ideas, differentiating ideas, great stories, great content. We just don't operate very well with it. And so they get lost. And so that's the real shame in all of this is that so many good ideas get either trapped in small containers like blog posts rather than huge ideas, or they get lost altogether in the sort of nicks and crannies of the business because just nobody's paying attention. Yeah. So Robert, this is marketing cheat codes. And it sounds like you're on to, we'll call it the biggest, you really well-defined that business problem challenge state. If you were to give advice to organizations on one thing where they could get to that next level of thinking, operational excellence, what would be the cheat code that you would offer? <laughs> well, there's two, um, I would say, and 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 the first cheat code is quite honestly looking at audiences as the thing that we're trying to build, rather than sort of a library of content. And what I mean by that is, is that to say to sort of shift perspective, it's the idea of taking the content we're producing and simply looking at it with the same lens that we do our products and services. And so we say, whenever we develop a new product, whenever we develop a new service, there is a, we've usually got a very well-defined process for that. There's somebody who understands the marketplace. There's someone who goes through all of the, the hoops to be able to do all those things. We, you know, we understand it. We understand where the costs are. We understand, you know, cause it's what, it's what we do, right? It's the way we operate. If we can just shift, just tap the cheat code to say, Anytime we want to create a piece of content or a, or a platform of content, whether it's as expansive as a digital magazine or a blog or a TV network or a print magazine, all the way down to whether we want to create an ebook or a white paper, look at it through the lens of how do we, how would we create this as a product? Like if this was our product, if this was our service, what would we do? Everything else that follows will be different as a result because you'll start thinking about, well, how would we promote this product? How would we service the customer with this product? How would we actually monetize this product? What does success look like? And all those things. So instead of content being sort of this thing that everybody does, but nobody strategizes about, 
content suddenly becomes as strategic as something that we would put into the marketplace. And if you can do that, all of the things that you need to do become sort of self-evident as, oh, right, we, of course we need to do that. Of course we need to do this. Of course we need to do that. And it puts much more responsibility on us to start to get our arms around how we're doing it carefully. Because we wouldn't just willy-nilly throw out product because we can, you know, oh, Bob and Jim and Mary and Jane, they can all create product. We wouldn't let them because it's what we do. Content is what we do. So looking at it from a product perspective is my advice to say, tap that cheat code and just change your lens immediately and say, what is it like if it's a product? That's awesome. Productize your content. Look at it like a product. How do I take this product yeah. to market? How do I merchandise that? Exactly. Excellent. Well, great. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you for joining Marketing Cheat Codes, dropping the first cheat code out into the market with us. And for folks who are maybe just seeing you for the first time, I know how to find you. You just Google anything content marketing related. Boom, you're popping up. Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? If you just hit our website, which is contentadvisory.net, um, you can pretty much find us. And uh, yeah, as you say, if you search the if you search the social web, it's kind of hard to miss me. So, <laughs> awesome, Robert. Thanks for coming on the show today. Absolutely a pleasure. Cheers.